All right, everybody. When I say aronia, what comes to your mind? Aronia. Hmm. For most of us, nothing comes to mind. We never heard of it. But actually, aronia is one of the fastest growing crops now in North Dakota. So here to enlighten us about this outbreak of aronia across our state is Kathy Wiederholt, the Hardy Fruit Project Manager from the Carrington Research Center. Kathy? An outbreak of aronia. That's right. pretty right. cute. <laughs> well, thank you, Tom. And hello, everybody. Good to see everybody again. I guess, you know, I'm just seeing you in the camera there. <laughs> I'm imagining you. So, yeah, we'll talk about aronia. And Tom's right. Most people have not heard about aronia. And I have to tell you, it's a really huge crop, but not here in the U.S. So... We'll just get here to the first slide. And uh, I have to tell you that I Googled the like O-N-I-A, what will rhyme with aronia? And I couldn't find any better word than zirconia. So there we are, zirconia aronia. So, <laughs> so all right, here's our picture of aronia. And you have a picture on your handout. You can see the little berries perhaps better on your handout than on here. And uh, this is just, to illustrate like how many fruits there are on this plant. They're, they, they are one of the most fruitful plants. There's one nursery that said, we chose this plant and to our chagrin, it still had the most fruit of any, of any um, woody plant. So uh, you can see here, they're kind of a reddish color when they start and then they turn to a purple blue color, kind of a blue black color. And then in the lower left hand corner there, I'm picking them and my hands are turning kind of a purple black color. Uh, they're a very, very rich fruit. Uh, one thing on your handout you could notice is the shape of those fruits. They look like little miniature delicious apples, in my opinion. They're kind of got wide shoulders and a narrow bottom. And you can see the bottom has that same apple scar, that same blossom scar that an apple does, that little five-starred little object there. So they're just, they're kind of cute. Um, so yeah, aronia is a huge commercial crop. We just don't grow it in a huge way here in the U.S., but we're kind of starting to. We're just a little bit here in North Dakota, but there's some other areas that are a little ahead of us. Um, this fruit was actually, uh, the, one of the parents is from North America, from the U.S. It's the black variety called Aronia melanocarpa. And uh, there's also red ones and purple ones. And so what happened is someone took our wild aronia and they took it to Europe. And there was a, a plant breeder named Ivan Michurin, and he's very famous. There's statues of him around different places in Russia. Um, so he crossbred this with a sorbus or mountain ash. So the aronia we're using for fruit today is not truly the wild American fruit. It's, it's this intergeneric hybrid, two genuses brought together to make this fruit. And the, the uh, berries we're eating today are about 75% aronia and then about 25% mountain ash. Um, some of the place, well, I think all of the websites you will read about aronia, they all say that this is a native North American fruit. Well, it, it kind of is, but it's not totally true. So I think, you know, like Tom said, we take everything with a grain of salt when we <laughs> read it online. We're trying to sell you something. So anyway, let's continue on with the weirdness of aronia. Um, aronia are tetraploids, which is, I mean, maybe not that weird. I'm not a plant geneticist. I uh, don't really know that much about breeding plants. But, um, you know, daylilies, well, I should say, they're tetraploids. So There's four copies of the chromosomes. Daylilies, right? Daylilies come in diploids with two sets of chromosomes, uh, and they come with four sets of chromosomes. Humans are diploids. We have two sets of chromosomes. Uh, there's other weird things. Uh, strawberries that you uh, buy in the grocery store, they're actually octopoids. They have eight sets of chromosomes. So we eat all kinds of crazy stuff. The plants, they know what's going on, but uh, we probably don't. So so aronia, uh, the way they, they reproduce is um, they, they do make seeds, but when you plant the seed, it can be almost exactly like the parent because they do something called apomictic seed production. They, uh, you don't need pollen to fertilize that little embryo. You just, 
somehow though it flowers and that just causes the seeds to form um, you just you just don't need pollination so it's pretty interesting this year I'm actually going to try to bag some of my my flowers and see what happens because I think I've heard that if there's pollination you will get better fruit set but I don't know if that's true or not June berries kind of do this too and um, there's actually a few honeyberries. They're not apomictic, but uh, there's a few honeyberries that are self-fruitful. So I'm just going to try a couple of different things with bagging flowers to see what happens uh, later in the season. So that'll be kind of fun for me, I guess. I'll try to tell you about it. Um, anyway, another thing, because of this whole apomictic thing where uh, you don't need the, the embryo to be pollinated, there's very little genetic diversity among Aronia. You can actually buy different cultivars. There's about that I know of, there's eight or nine or ten different cultivars, but what we can generally buy in the catalogs are Nero and Viking. Uh, Mackenzie is, was selected here in North Dakota, and there's one called Galachenka, and there's some other ones that I probably can't pronounce. A lot of these come from Poland. Um, <clears throat> and some, some places that buy Aronia say that this variety of Aronia is better than all these other varieties of Aronia. But now uh, the Carrington Research Center is joining a study, and we're going to see whether this is true or not, because we do not believe that could possibly be true because of the way they make, the way they reproduce. There's just very little uh, genetic variation in the plants. So if you think of their family tree with all the different branches, it's a stick. Like their family tree is a stick, like a yardstick. There are no branches. It's just, they're all the same, basically. It's actually, um, it's a, uh, what do I want to see? say, uh, cloning. It's kind of like cloning or like um, uh, grafting. You know, it's the same plant. It's really the same plant. All right. I said that a lot of other places in the world grow aronia and that we don't really, but on this slide, uh, you can see aronia has been grown in Eastern Europe and Russia uh, since really the 40s and the 50s. And actually kind of a note I read several years ago is that Ukraine used to be the center of aronia production. And then they had the big Chernobyl nuclear accident, and that ruined all the soil. There's so much uh, radiation in the soil that they couldn't grow and export and eat the aronia that they produced there. So Poland kind of stepped in, and they already did produce a lot of fruit, so they kind of stepped in for uh, aronia. Poland produces 90% of the world's aronia, 15,000 acres. That is a lot. That is really a lot. It's 55 tons of fruit. Um, compare that to the U.S. now, and Iowa is the center of U.S. production that kind of got started there about 20 years ago or so. They've got about 13,000 acres, and then what I read recently is that the Midwest, which includes Iowa, has several thousand acres. So I don't really know if that's 2,000 acres or 3,000 acres, but um, they, there's quite a bit. Um, North Dakota, as far as we can calculate, is about 62 acres. So we're, we're starting, you know, we're just starting, which is kind of neat. Uh, it's very hardy here. It does not have a problem growing, so that's good. Uh, of that 62 acres, at least half, maybe 35 to 40 acres, is really grown by three different families. There's one family that has uh, 12 acres, one man has 15 acres, and another man has 20 acres. So they will all be using mechanized harvest for those plants, you know, those crops. Uh, the other people, not so sure what they're going to do. Maybe we can join together, you know, people can join together and uh, maybe get a harvester together or there's some other options out there now. So they're thinking about uh, maybe someone will come in and harvest the Saronia. So that's kind of cool. But yeah, our 62 acres, we just have a little, <laughs> it's kind of cute. <clears throat> All right, when I was researching this, I found some, I was trying to find out information about Aronia uh, worldwide even, or here. Uh, but here's this report from University of Nebraska, and they did this uh, food traffic report, and it was completed in 2013. It's kind of cool, this five-year new product trend. And it said that there were over 540 new products containing Aronia that were introduced worldwide. And I think it's, I don't know what it says about America here, but 73, I think, 73% of the uh, new products were in Europe. And we only had, was that 14% here in, in, the, in North America, so that includes Canada, right? So um, we're not, we could eat a little more aronia here if we tried, I think. <laughs> um, 
so of these products that were introduced, these 540 new products, only a third of them had aronia in the name. So that would have been aronia juice or aronia jelly or aronia wine. And then two thirds of those products had aronia as an ingredient. And you should look at juices you buy that have a dark purple color because I do know that old orchard brand juice, uh, we've bought some kind of, a, I don't know if it was a blueberry, I'm not sure, it's been quite a long time, but some kind of a dark colored juice. And when you looked at the label, there was some aronia in there. And that's pretty much for color because aronia is just such a dark colored fruit. Um, if you ever do those energy shots, I think, or some kind of little boost things, people have brought them to me to show me the ingredients and some of those have aronia in them too. So, so you're, it's, it's around, it's around. We just have to maybe eat a little more. <laughs> um, also part of this report, this five year new product trend, you can see how aronia is used. Mainly it's being used in drinks. So that's the easiest way to use the aronia. You squeeze it and get the juice out of it. But then uh, dairy foods and then confectionery. Uh, this last summer I went to a meeting and they had these little aronia gummies there. I have to say they were really, really good. They said that they concentrate the juice down to 66% solid. So it's probably quite thick. And then there's, I suppose there's gelatin involved and some kind of starches and um, I really thought these would be gross and sweet, but they're actually, they weren't that sweet and they were pretty tasty. So I was surprised about the gummies. Um, and then the dairy food, uh, that's a very good way to use aronia. It will, it, it, it kind of helps the taste, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, also this second table here, these are, I, I copied just the top five things so that we could actually see them on the slide. Um, they're actually, each list was about 15, I don't know about 20, but at least 15 different things. Um, so the type of aronia ingredients, it's mainly just plain things. I mean, aronia, aronia juice, aronia concentrate, aronia juice concentrate, aronia juice from concentrate. So it's all kind of the same thing, but uh, mostly you're getting the juice when you, um, when you have this kind of product. Um, and then here's where we're going to, this is the whole zirconia. Is it zirconia or is it a diamond? You know, the health claims. Um, well, the one thing that's kind of undisputed, I think, is this fruit is number one in antioxidants. It is one of the very highest fruits. It is the highest fruit, actually, uh, among 100 fruits that the USDA has tested. There's this uh, value called an ORAC value. It has to do with um, how many free radicals that a uh, that the extract from a fruit can scavenge. And free radicals are things that damage your DNA. They, they help you age a little bit. Um, we don't want free radicals in our bodies. And so these antioxidants from fruits and vegetables can help uh, dampen those things. So aronia, you know, 15, 16,000, it's TE, which I think is total equivalence. Um, but if you look like where is blueberry, it's way down there. And when we when you read things about the level of antioxidants in, in uh, aronia versus blueberry, they say three to five times higher in the aronia versus the blueberry. So um, currants are kind of in there. I wish currants were a little higher because I love currants, right? If you've heard me talk before, I love currants. But elderberry is uh, quite high. And actually, uh, in the previous slide, I talked about the five-year uh, five uh, fruit things there. Was it the five-year product trends? where there were 540 new aronia products in the last five years, there was over a thousand new elderberry products. And I doubt if we eat many elderberry products here in the US. So we are missing out, I think. I think we're really missing out. <laughs> so let's look at these other health claims. I don't really have a lot to say about them, but the other health claims you can read. Uh, and if you just Google aronia, you can read lots of health claims, right? Lowers your blood pressure. It lowers your blood sugar, lowers your diabetes risk. Um, useful in fighting oxidative stress in, in your cardiovascular system. Um, you know what they've said, inhibits the biomarkers of colon cancer. So might inhibit colon cancer in rats. Uh, it's anti-inflammatory, anti-carcinogenic. Protective during chemotherapy. Uh, urinary tract health, it would help improve that. Fights bacteria and fights viruses. Uh, reduces eye inflammation. Well, can all these things be true? You know, who knows, right? But, I, you know, just the word is caution. Use caution when you're reading any of this stuff on the internet, right? And, and the thing is, even, I mean, these are actually all results from, say, university research. These are things published in, in, art, in, in journals. So 
there is real research on Aronia, really a research that turns out really good. But you know what? It's this here, you know, all in moderation. We just, we can't believe everything. Uh, animal models are not human models, human subjects, you know. The extracts that they use in the test may not have been digested by your stomach, and that changes everything. And then the concentrations that they use when they're doing these tests, you know, sometimes you, you just can't get that much when you eat these things, you know. And I have to say, I read the paper on the eye health, and what they did is they used ethanol to extract the compounds in the, in the aronia berries. They did it twice, and then they concentrated it, and then they injected that aronia right into the rat's eye. So um, I don't think anybody's going to let someone inject aronia juice into their eye, but they did see positive changes when they did that. So you can say that there, in theory, there may be a, there may be something positive for eye health if you if you ate aronia. But again, you know, you're not digesting it. They were putting it right into your eye. So all of these health claims for different fruits and vegetables, you know, the whole the broad picture of research on fruits and vegetables so, show that they are good for you. But I would just say, you know, we shouldn't go nuts on one thing. We just need to eat all things in moderation and just um, take it all with a grain of salt, a small grain of salt, because we shouldn't eat too much salt either, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, so just use caution, use caution. And the other thing I should say about this, you know, if, if I know there's, I, I saw a juice once and it was called Aero Juice, A-R-O Juice. And aronia was maybe the fourth or fifth ingredient. The best way to get something out of, you know, if, if you're saying I'm, I'm eating aronia for my health, the best way to use it is not to drink it where it's the fifth ingredient. The best way to get that healthful component is to actually eat the berry. So, and we will talk about how wonderful these berries are, right? So I, here I said caution again, just be careful. Um, I just kind of want to touch on growing aronia. They are one of the easiest plants to grow, I think. They grow fine here at, at the Carrington Center. Uh, our soil pH is about 7.8 to 8 in different places. Um, so they do just fine there. We have very good yields. We've achieved almost 14 pounds per plant, and that was an average over four varieties. So uh, maybe some varieties did have closer to that 15 uh, pounds per plant. Sometimes in Iowa, they're talking about 20 or 30 pounds. So I think if you were to irrigate them a little more, and we generally do not irrigate, but if you irrigate it a little more, maybe uh, they probably don't need a lot of fertilizer, but to irrigate them would probably help. You might get a higher yield. But I think that you can really count on getting like on an off year, you can definitely count on getting like five pounds per plant. And then on a really good year, you should be able to count on 10 to 15 pounds per plant. And if you remember that picture from the very first, those the bushes are loaded. The, the berries just drag the leaves right down to the ground. It's pretty crazy. So, um, uh, oh, I, I, I mentioned the sweetness on here. That's actually kind of a decent sugar level. It's not really high like a grape. grape Grape can be 24 or 26% sugar. So these are kind of high. Um, so, you know, they're not sour. So that's one thing. Um, the only insect problems we've had so far has been insects on the leaves. And those ones on the top right side, those are pear slug sawflies. They look like slugs, but they're actually a fly larva. And they eat the top side of the leaf. And then we have these lace bugs, not to be confused with lace wings, which are a good insect, but uh, lace bugs. And they like nibble on the bottom side of the leaf. So you've got the top and the bottom. And you know, that won't really bother your plant that year for the most part, unless you have a really heavy infestation. And still, it's not going to you know, hurt your fruit production that year for the most part. It's going to be the next year. If the, if the plant has spent energy making fruit, and then it can't use its leaves to do a lot of photosynthesis, then you're not going to have a lot of fruit the next year. And uh, for the home gardener, uh, I really would just suggest using a strong spray of water. And I don't have water out in the, in the research field. I just have uh, myself out there. And I do do one application of uh, kind of an organic. My, mine is not organic, but you can buy organic variations of a spinosad product. And that one application of that product takes care of all of those things. It happens um, before the flowers fruit. So uh, it's quite a long, a long interval. 
Uh, but here at home, I would just say to spray them with a strong stream of water and you would remove most of them. You don't need to remove all of them, just remove most of them. So let's see. And the last thing I want to say here, uh, just on things that might bother, this is from a whole nother talk, and I don't know if someone will talk to you about this this year, but the spotted wing drosophila. It's a fruit fly that has moved into our area, and some of you may have seen this on your raspberries in the last year. Maybe your strawberries, your cherries, they really like the soft red fruit, but they can bother other things. Um, in the center, that is a, one of my strawberries from my garden with a little maggot there in there. It's wonderful. On the right side, those two pictures are from my garden in town of uh, black raspberries. I no longer have black raspberries. They were getting old anyway. I'd probably had them for seven years, and I just topped them off. I didn't want to deal with this anymore. Um, there's a lot. And then on the left side, those are June berries. And we had a delay in harvest because of rain and some other circumstances at the research center. And the fruit flies, these spotted wing drosophila fruit flies, those are all those holes are all where they laid an egg. And then the, the hole got big as the little uh, pupa came out. You can actually see them coming out there. Uh, we have not seen this in Aronia. Aronia ripens at the end of August, early September, and it is possible for these fruit flies to build up to really high numbers. I wonder why we haven't seen it in Aronia. And my thought, my theory, Kathy's theory, is that it's very dry by that time of the year, and these things really like a moist environment. So perhaps they, their numbers go down after a while. I'm not sure. But I can definitely tell you those plants hung on the shrub like two weeks, and we did not see any spotted wing drosophila. So um, we'll just have to watch them and see what happens. We're joining with Esther McGinnis and Jan Canodal and their grad students, and they're going to be coming and getting some fruit from us and, I guess, putting up nets and doing all kinds of great things out there. So we're going to be sharing our, our uh, fruit project with them. Um, so is the sparkle real? I think you already know the answer from my handout. Uh, I think it is real. These, you know, they are very healthful fruits. The one thing I did not talk about is their taste, and that I may have mentioned that in the handout. Nobody really eats an aronia raw. They're super duper tannic. They will dry out your mouth, and that's not to be confused with bitterness. Bitterness is like the inside of a lemon peel, a really sharp, uh, like an IPA beer, or unsweetened chocolate or coffee. That's bitter. These are tannic. They dry your mouth out. And uh, yeah, the best way to eat the aronia is really to freeze them and then uh, put them in something. Put them in your hot oatmeal, and that kind of takes care of that tannin. Put them in dairy products. One of those, um, well, that five-year study where it said, uh, or five-year product thing, it said the number two product that aronia went into was a dairy product. It really goes great in ice cream or yogurt because the proteins in the dairy products, they kind of bind onto that tannin and then it kind of removes that, that drying compound. So anyway, um, I'm getting the cutoff single signal. I could tell you all kinds of things, but I'm not gonna. So yeah, aronia sparkles. It's a diamond, not a zirconia. All right. Yeah, there's a comment from the audience about, uh, you talked about those tannins. Is that why aronia is called choke berry? Yes, choke berry is another name for aronia. And I guess nobody really liked choke berry, so we just call it by the genus name. But yeah, the tannins make it choky. And and you eat the whole berry. You eat the whole berry. There's, There's little no seeds pit. in it, just like an apple. Just go eat, eat the apple. whole thing. Eat the whole thing. Does it get black knot disease? Does not, because black knot disease is in the prunus family, and these are not in the prunus family. How tall does an aronia shrub get? You know, ours are about uh, my face height. I'm five foot six, so my, about five feet tall. But um, the old, old Mackenzie's at the Plant Material Center are about seven to eight feet tall and about eight to ten feet wide. Mackenzie is the biggest variety. It just grows a little larger. But I would say if you go about, uh, say, five feet tall by about five feet wide. Right, so it's a bush. It is not a tree. It is a bush. It uh, does have some suckering, but it's not aggressive. You can definitely keep it in check. It expands from the crown. Is there a place where we can sell that fruit if we decide to, since you're inspiring us tonight, uh, <laughs> we might want to plant acres of them. Is there a place to sell it? 
people are working on this on their own right now in North Dakota, although we've had, we've had two meetings the last two winters. This meeting was to talk about how to come together as a group and maybe try to market Aronia in North Dakota. And if you contact me at the Research Center, I can get you in touch with that group. And uh, if you want to really plant like 10 or 12 acres, there's some other things we have to do. We can, we can talk about that. But most people are just kind of cultivating their own market, uh, selling at a farmer's market, getting their neighbors to buy it, uh, getting some winemakers possibly to buy it, jelly makers. How about birds? Do birds like chokeberry? Birds have not really taken them in North Dakota. I have seen where the birds, their beak has broken the flesh. And those are the ones I eat that eventually get stuck in my throat because they're so dry. But uh, the birds generally aren't, haven't been a terrible problem. I can't say that for every area, but um, have not been a problem in, in, in Carrington. Okay, Kathy, is this the perfect fruit? Because it's so adaptable to our soils, so hardy, birds don't eat it. Not many bugs. It's so productive and precocious that you start getting fruit. You don't have to wait 10 years no, to get a third harvest. Year. Second, third, third year, you're ready to rock and roll. You just got to learn to develop a taste for it. I think that's it. You just have to learn to develop a taste and for it. And it's so nutritious. <laughs> it is. <laughs> and how about... You throw them and put them in like banana bread, right? That's how... I, I said I made banana bread with them, and I thought, well, this will be a failure. It was fabulous. I was shocked it was fabulous. <laughs> and how about the ornamental value of you, the shrub itself? They're pretty nice. They're very shiny green, and the leaves are shiny green. There's a nice white flower in about June 1st or so. And then the berries will hang on. If you don't pick them, they'll hang on there. And uh, 2014 was a very long, nice fall. Aronia can have some really nice red foliage color in the fall. Uh, we generally don't see it so much in North Dakota just because of the way our fall progresses. But 2014 was, was a cool year and just uh, fabulous for color that year. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of Aronia is sold for ornamental value. There's Iroquois Beauty. It's a small one. It's, it's smaller, but it's in the same, um, the same uh, species with the fruit production. So you could definitely eat the fruit that it produces. And you say it's apomictic, so we don't have to worry about like our bee crisis and pollinating. Nope. We don't have to worry about that. Nope. So. What I've mainly seen on it when it flowers is um, flies, like the pollinating flies. There's a lot of different flies that do our pollination here in North Dakota. And the other thing about to let people know about, to get started, you say it's a, it has a very narrow genetic range between mm -hmm. the different cultivars. And Mackenzie is available, it's from North Dakota, it's available from Soil, Soil Conservation, Conservation District for dirt cheap prices. Buck or two, usually. So you don't have to go to a garden, you don't have to go buy a $10 right. plant, you can just go through your Soil Conservation District. And these are and, available now in most catalogs, like yeah. Jung's has them, yeah. and right. I can't think of other names right now, but a lot of catalogs will have maybe Mackenzie or maybe Nero, and I would go for either of those, that's yeah, fine. And so then the Mackenzie. Mackenzie's very... Very affordable. Any other questions out there about uh, the sparkling aronia? <laughs> okay, that's it. Thank you, Kathy. That's really I'm going to put in one plug for our field sure. day. Next, this year is uh, Tuesday, July 19th. And Tom said I could do this, and I totally forgot about it. We are looking for some recipes of things that, fruits that grow in shelter belts. And you have my contact information through here. You can look me up at Carrington. It should be, be on the handout. But we are looking for recipes for any kind of shelter belt fruit. Uh, could be buffalo berries, could be june berries, could be aronia, could be plums, uh, choke or um, crab apples, anything we grow in shelter belts. So send them to us, little cherries. And uh, this is through NDSU. It's not, it's not a like for sale thing. It's going to be a little, pro, a little uh, bulletin through NDSU. And you see Kathy's emails right there on this on the yep. screen and her phone number, so you can reach her that way. We would love it. There you go, and Facebook there too. So thank you, Kathy. And we're going to take another five minute break, and then we're going to talk about one of the most uh, timely topics of the day: how to plant and transplant trees and shrubs. So we're going to do that in five minutes. <laughs> 